The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. The program you are now hearing is one of the most popular on the air. It's listened to in millions of homes. This means that we of the Equitable Society have a very serious responsibility. We must key our Equitable Society messages to home and family problems and give our listeners real help in solving those problems. Tonight's Equitable commercial will tell about the Equitable Education Fund. If you have children, be sure to listen to this important message from the Equitable Life Assurance Society, coming in 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Half-Pint Horse Players. Your FBI has just completed another in its series of uniform crime reports. A study of crime and criminals throughout the 48 states. What the survey has to say about juvenile delinquency is frightening. Because this refers to no local situation, but to a national emergency. You hear of crimes such as robbery, auto theft, fraud, and forgery. And you think of them as being committed by hardened criminals with long records. And yet, the unfortunate truth, as shown by this latest FBI survey, is that almost one-third of all the crimes in those categories committed during the first half of this year were committed by boys and girls under the age of 21. Tonight's file opens in a large room in the back of a pool parlor. There's a long counter against one wall behind which men are taking bets on horses. Two boys, one of them 17 and the other 15, approach the counter. Hey, Joe, that looks like the guy who runs the joint right over there. Uh-huh. Yeah, let's talk to him. Okay, Phil. The first at Belmont, they got away at 1.35. They all went. Hey, you the boss here? Huh? Yeah, why? Well, that guy down at the other end, don't want to take my bet. We don't bet with kids. Hey, luck, it's American money, ain't it, mister? Yeah, let me handle this, Joe. Hey, how'd your kids get in here? Through the pool room, like everybody else. Uh, go out the same way. And here comes hey, the guys. winner at New York. Big Dip, the winner. Happy Breed, second. Star Song, third. No prices yet. Hey, look, mister. What is it? I got a tip on this horse, and I got to get down someplace. Well, uh, someplace else, not here. Listen, I was betting parlays when I was in grade school. He used to work for a bookmaker back home. Uh, give him your action, then. I'm telling you for the last time, get out of here. Go on, blow. Yeah, come on, Joe. Right. Where are we going, Phil? Uh, let's find some other place where we can make a bet. Hey, uh, fellas. Uh, fellas. Wait a minute. Are you calling us? Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I want to talk to you. What about? Well, I uh, happened to be on the Erie when you were trying to get your bet down with Lou. Yeah, so what? So I felt sorry for you. <laughs> Thanks. Come on, Joe. Now, wait a minute. Well? Well, I'm a horse player myself. I know how it is when you got a hot horse and you can't get any action. Uh, look, if uh, you want to hang around out there in the pool room, I'll make your bets for you. Hey. Hey, that sounds okay. Now, wait a minute. What's in it for you, Mac? Well, if you have a good day, you stake me 10% of your winnings. Huh. That sounds fair enough, Phil. Eh, that's okay. A deal? A deal. Swell. Now, what do you want to bet? Well, there's 40 clams. They'll be in the next two at New York. Blackjack and Dusty Lakes. 20 if, 20 in reverse. 20 if, 20 in reverse. You got it. Now, now wait a minute. Huh? You give us the results as soon as they come in? Oh, sure, kid, sure. Okay. Come on, Joe. Let's go on out and shoot a rack of pool, huh? Yeah, 
six ball in the corner. Okay, Joe, rack him up. Phil. Yeah, what? We, uh, we better stop shooting pool pretty soon. Uh, why? We won't be able to pay the time. We gave that guy our last $40. Uh, don't worry, kid. We got a winner soon. Why? That system. Never goes more than four races in a row without a winner. Yeah, I know, but... Well, if we don't win this one, we got no more cash. Yeah, so what? We still got all the other stuff. I know, but that ain't cash. Hey, Joe, get out of my way. Let me take a shot. Hey, 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 wait. Here comes our guy. Oh, yeah. Hey, how do we do, Mac? Well, you blew a picture. Oh, another one? Uh-huh. Tough break. Oh, gee. This just ain't our day, Phil. Mm. Well, what do you want next, kid? I like a horse called Noble King. All right, how much you want to bet? I can't make a bet. Why not? I'm tapped out. No cash left at all? Nope. Oh, that's too bad. Well, sorry you didn't have a better day. Look, uh, if you get any fresh scratch, come back again, you hear? Now you just ask for Charlie. That's hey, wait a minute, Charlie. I want to talk to you. Hey, look, kid, if it's about dough, I ain't holding so good myself. No, no, no. I, I don't want to put the bite on you. I want to sell you something. Huh? Yeah. Take a look at this. Hey. hey that's a real nice piece of merchandise. It's a genuine ruby. Ah, real nice. Hey, uh, Charlie. What's it worth to you? Well, I couldn't say offhand. If you don't want to buy that, Phil, we could show him that emerald pin. Emerald pin? Yeah. Hey, what are you guys running? Teenage Tiffany's? Yeah, we got plenty of stuff like this. No kidding? Oh, sure. Uh, look, fellas. Uh, let's go over and sit down where it's nice and quiet, huh? I think we can do some business. <laughs> Not more than ten city blocks away from the pool room in a local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just greeting a fellow agent. Hello there, Ellis. Hello, Jim. When did you get back in town? Just this morning. Uh, you all finished up on the Wilson case? Yeah. I've been assigned to the case you're working on. Hey, that's fine. I can use the help. What's the story on it, Jim? Well, a local couple named Russell were returning in their car from a vacation trip to the Middle West. Yes? Last night, about three hours outside of town, they stopped and picked up some hitchhikers. Three youngsters. I see. Shortly after the pickup, one of the youngsters pulled a gun on them. He stopped the car, ordered the couple out. The other boys tied them up, and they were left abandoned on a lonely road. And the boys drove off in the car? That's right. Where did all this happen, Jim? Across the state line, just east of Fairfield. Has uh, the car turned up yet? Yeah, it was found abandoned here in town early this morning. How much did the kids get? Well, they got about $200 in cash from Mr. Russell, but they took luggage which contained Mrs. Russell's jewelry, about $14,000 worth. Well, any descriptions? Mm-hmm, fairly good one on all three of the boys. I presume you've already sent out an alarm. Yes, I went out this morning, along with the story to the papers. I thought that the publicity might help us on this case. I see. We also gave the papers a description of the pieces of jewelry that were stolen. What about uh, fingerprints? Well, we found some around the car. We sent them down to Washington and to Fairfield. To Fairfield? Well, I didn't think we'd have those youngsters in our files in Washington, but I thought we'd take a chance that maybe they came from the town where the Russells picked them up. Oh, I see. What do we do now, Jim? I guess the only other thing left to do is go over this list of hotels and rooming houses and check on every one. Uh-huh. Here, Ellis, let's split it up and get to work. There at the post at Hawthorne. Get your bets down. Hello. Uh... Excuse me, Lou. Uh, what is it? Uh, can I talk to you for a minute? Oh, look, Charlie, this is my busiest time of the day. Yeah, but it's important, Lou. Real important. Another touch? No, no, Lou. Honest, I swear it ain't. No, I got a proposition that can mean a lot of money to you. Uh, let's go into your office and talk, huh? Just for a minute. Well... Oh, please, Lou. Okay, come on. Ah, swell. Hey, Walt! Yeah? You handle the payoffs. I'm going into my office. Right. Go ahead, Charlie. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks. Now, um, what's your deal? Well, uh, this is a chance for the both of us to make a real bundle. How? Well, you remember those kids who came in today and wanted to bet some horses? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I got talking to them after they left here, see? And, uh, well, we talked about horses, and then we talked about money, and they said they needed dough. One of them flashed a ring. I bought it off them. Here, take a look at it. Hey, that looks real. It is real. Where would kids get a ring like that? Well, that's what I wondered. 
Then I remembered a story that was in this afternoon's paper. I just finished reading it when I met him. What about? About a stick-up out on Fairfield Turnpike. Here. Here's the story. $14,000 worth of jewelry was taken. Three kids did the job. Hey, let's see that. Now, this ring is described in the story as one of the pieces that's missing. You see? Right there. Oh, yeah. Now, the kids I've been talking to are the ones that done the job. Hey, the story says, it says three kids. Yeah. yeah, well, the other one is waiting for him someplace with the rest of the jewelry. Now, here's the proposition, Lou. See, I made a deal with him. I told him I'd give him five grand for the whole lot. Well, they went for it big. Now, they're going to bring the stuff to my room tonight at seven. Hey, where are you getting five grand? I ain't really giving him five. When I get him up the room, I'm cutting him down to two. Where are you getting two? Well, I sort of figured that's where you come in. Yeah, I thought so. Well, look at the action you're getting, Lou. Fourteen thousand bucks worth. Why do you have to pay him at all? When they come up with the stuff, why don't you grab it and tell him to blow? Oh, you can't trust kids. They're liable to scream or make trouble. Lou, believe me, this is a terrific bargain. As a matter of fact, I'll see to it that we not only get the rings and stuff, but you get your two grand back, too. How? Well, I'll bring them back to the horse room. They'll bet it back with you. What do you say, Lou? Yeah. Okay. That you, Ellis? Yes, Jim. Hope you had better luck than I did. No, couldn't find any trace of those kids. Uh-huh. Anything come in while I was gone? Yes, we received word from the Fairfield police. Did they identify the three boys? Yeah, the oldest one is named Phil Osborne. He's 17. Who are the other two? The other two are brothers, Joe and Tom Sherman. I see. The Fairfield police also passed on a message from their parents. They said that if we catch the youngsters to keep them, they didn't want to be bothered with them anymore. That's nice. That's probably the reason the kids ran away in the first place. That'd be my guess. You can't raise children by remote control. It takes work. Oh, you're telling me. I've got two of my own. I work just as hard at home trying to help my kids grow up as I do here at the office. Okay. Pardon me. Special Agent Taylor. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. Yeah? He did? Yes. Yes, thanks very much, Lieutenant. Goodbye. That was Lieutenant Mitchell down at police headquarters. Yes? A special policeman at the Capitol Theater saw two boys answering to the description we sent out leaving the theater about a half an hour ago. Did he detain them? Well, he tried to, but they got away from him. Where's the special policeman now, Jim? He's waiting up at the theater. Ellis, I think I'll run up there and talk to him. Just a minute. Hiya, Charlie. Oh, hello, fellas. Come on in. Go ahead, Joe. Right. Well, you got here right on a button. Yeah. Yeah, did you bring the stuff with you? Uh-huh. Ah, where is it? Uh, Joe's got it. Yeah, it's right here in my pocket. Well, what do you say? Let's have a look at it. Oh, sure. Well, wait a minute, Joe. Huh? Just keep it in your pocket. Well, what's the matter? We want to see some money first. Well, sure, kid. Have but... you got five grand? Well... Not exactly. What do you mean? Well, I went all over town, dug up all the cash I could. The best I could raise was two. But you promised us five. I know, kid, but... No more buts. We ain't interested. Come on, Joe. Wait a minute. Well? You better change your mind. Why? I know where that stuff came from. What are you talking about? You kids did that job out in the Fairfield Turnpike. It was in the papers. Yeah, so what? So, if you don't do business with me, I blow a whistle. You turn us into the cops? That's right. Now, do we do business with two grand? You got it with you? Yeah. Let's see it. Sure. There it is. Phil, are you going to take it? Yeah. With his gun. Huh? Hey, what is this? I got a gun, wise guy. Now, let's have the dough. Come on. Drop it on the floor. Uh, what about the rings and stuff? Well, we keep them. Hey, now, look, you can't just, just get... Just drop that dough. I'm warning you. Drop it or I'll shoot. Phil, wait. You can't shoot. I got the bullet. Huh? Now, what do you do, big shot? I use this end of the gun. Phil. What is it, stupid? Here's the bullets. <laughs>
return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Close your eyes as you listen to one of those traditional college songs. You see the cheering section in the stadium or the group around the fire in the fraternity house. Yep, those were the days. Yes, but don't forget they were days of learning, too. And believe it or not, there's a real tie-up between learning and earning. For instance, the average college graduate earns $72,000 more during his working years than the average American. And that extra $72,000 is only half the story. The well-educated man has a keener appreciation of the finer things of life, a better understanding of what makes the world go round. That's why everyone agrees that college is the best investment loving fathers and mothers can make for their children. I hope my children will get the chance. Well, if I were you, Don, I wouldn't leave it to chance. Why not make sure they'll go? Make sure with an equitable education fund. An equitable education fund? What's that? It's a surefire plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. And it includes these important features. One... You start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Two, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Three, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payment. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. Oh, sounds okay to me, Mr. Keating. Where do I get one of those equitable education funds? The man to see is your equitable society representative. Give your children their chance to earn that extra $72,000 by getting in touch with your equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Half-Pint Horse Players. Any edition of your local newspaper will bring you fresh evidence of the fact that juvenile delinquency is one of the most pressing problems facing the nation today. Barely a day passes but that some new crime is reported that was committed by a boy or girl so young that the community is momentarily shocked into trying to fight the problem. But half-hearted measures or whole-hearted temporary measures are not the answer. The answer to juvenile delinquency lies in the home of every child, where the problem starts. As has been said in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, it takes work to raise children. But only by investing that work can you parents of America help fight the number one law enforcement problem of the nation. Tonight's file continues in the FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor has just returned from his visit to the theater. Well, Alice, the special policeman didn't have anything to add to what we got from headquarters. Too bad. Did you see these? What's that? This set of character notes on the three boys that came in from the Fairfield Police. No, no. What's it say? Well, one of them, Phil Osborne, he's the oldest, is a horse player. At 17? Yeah. Joe Sherman, the 15-year-old, is a tremendous eater. And according to Fairfield, he's not too bright. He can't be to get mixed up in something like this. The third boy, Joe's brother, Tom, is a movie fan. No? He's been known to stay in a movie house for ten hours at a stretch. Oh, Oh, I get it. Special Agent Taylor. Yes, Lieutenant. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. What's that address again? Uh, Just a minute while I write it down. Hand me a pencil. Thanks. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I've got it. 37 South 15th. Thanks again, Lieutenant. This may be something else. What's that, Jim? That was Lieutenant Mitchell again. They just had a report that two young boys answering the descriptions we sent out assaulted a man in a furnished room. Who made the report to the police? Man's landlady. He's still in his room. Come on, let's get over there and talk to him. Mr. Brown? That's right. My name is Taylor. This is Mr. Anderson. We're special agents of the FBI. Here are my credentials. Ah, I see. Well... What do you want? Your landlady reported to the police that you were assaulted here earlier this evening. That's right. Who did it? 
two boys. They said they were messengers when they came to the door. When I let them in, they knocked me out. I see. What do you know about the boys, Mr. Brown? Nothing. I never saw them before. Look, my landlady shouldn't have bothered busy men like you with something like this. Oh, that's quite all right. Oh, now, why don't you just forget about the whole thing and let me go back to bed? Huh? My head hurts. You say you never saw these boys before. And that you didn't know they were coming here? That's right. That's not the truth. Huh? You told your landlady at 6.30 that you were expecting two boys to call on you. And uh, let them right up to your room when they came. Ah, uh, she's crazy. Mr. Brown, before we ask you any more questions, may I see that ring you're wearing? Huh? Oh, uh... Well, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to get off. Oh, that's all right. I'll look at it right on your hand. Where'd you get this ring? Uh, my, uh, my father left it to me. It's been the family for years. I hate to tell you that you're lying again, but this ring is part of the loot from a job that was pulled last night on the Fairfield Turnpike. I'm telling you, it was my father's ring. Now, look, Brown, let's start all over again. And this time, let's try and tell the truth. <laughs> Joe, we're in good shape. Yeah. Yeah, we got two G's in cash, and we still got the jewelry. Uh-huh. Hey, you know what we do tomorrow? Nope. We hop a train, go to New York. And we can go to the movies, the races. Bill. Huh? I wish I was home. What? I, I mean it. Look at us. We got $2,000, and we can't even get a place to sleep in a hotel. But I told you, the cops will be watching every hotel. That's why I... Wish I was home, Phil. Ah, oh, come on. I used to have plenty to eat when I was home, Phil. You don't let me eat unless you're hungry. I ate too much. But I like to eat. I like to sleep, too. I could sleep at home whenever I wanted to. Now, look, Joe, your brother's waiting for us at the Capitol Theater. You can sleep there, okay? Only till about 12 o'clock. Look, it's open all night. Well, I'll sleep there tonight. And then tomorrow morning, the three of us go to New York. Ellis? Yes, Jim? I think Brown is ready to tell us the truth now. Aren't you, Brown? Yeah. All right, now let's have the whole story. How did you meet the boys? Well, they came to Lou Thomas's horse room to make a bet. Mm. I was there, and I picked them up. I see. And did you know who they were? No, not at first. But when one of them offered to sell me the ring, I remembered the description of the ring in a paper. You bought this ring from them? Yeah, for 50 bucks. Then I made a deal with them to buy everything they had. Where were you going to get the money? Well, Lou Thomas, the guy with the horse room, went in with me. He put up the money. Thomas knew what the money was to be used for? Sure. He was my partner. I see. Go on. What happened then? Well, then I made a date with the kids to buy their stuff from them 7 o'clock tonight. And they came up here and held you up? That's right. How much did they get? 2,000 bucks. Brown, have you any idea where they might have gone when they left here? Well, I wasn't altogether knocked out when they left. I, I think I heard one kid say they were going back to the movies to meet his brother. That'd be the third boy, Ellis. They didn't say what movie, did they? No, they didn't. Okay, Brown, get your coat. What for? We want you to come down to the office with us. Okay. What do we do about this man, Lou Thomas, Jim? Want to put up the 2,000? Yes. He's implicated, and we'll have him picked up. Why those dirty little crooks? What's the matter? Oh, one of them punks took my sport coat and left this dirty leather jacket. Here, let me look through that jacket. How do you like those guys? What thieves? Find anything, Jim? Yeah, I don't know how much help it's going to be, though. Three ticket stubs from the Capitol Theater. That's where they went today. Yes, that's right. Ellis, let's take Brown down to the office, and then let's go see a movie. See a movie? At this time of night? That's right. Come on, let's go. <laughs> We come upon many rare and beautiful specimens of the orchid. Nowhere in the world are so many different varieties to be found. And they constitute one of the main sources of export revenue. Jim. Yeah? Jim, you think we ought to ask the manager to throw on the house lights? No, I don't think that'll be necessary, Ellis. We should be able to spot them if they're here. It's a pretty small audience. Here? You see them being packed. Why don't you look up in the balcony while you work the orchestra? Hey, that's a pretty good idea. Go ahead. In two days, they'll be in your florist's window. Alice, Alice, wait a minute. What is it, Jim? 
Take a look at those three kids sitting down there. Yeah, they look like the ones we're looking I'm for. I'm sure it's him. Come on, let's get down there. And so you see how much the airplane has meant to the economy of Panaloa. Jim, I don't know how you figured they'd come back to the Capitol Theater. You remember how many ticket stubs there were in that leather jacket? Yes, three. That meant that all three of them came in here today. But the special policeman only saw two of them come out. See, that's right. Then there was one other thing. Remember in the notes from the Fairfield police, they said that one boy was a movie fan and could sit and watch the same movie for ten hours? Well, of course. All of the Panaloans are expert sailors, of course. And this canoe racing is their main sport. It takes two years to build one of these canoes. But once built, they are sturdy enough to last a lifetime. Hello, boys. Huh? You're Joe and Tom Sherman? Yeah, that's right. That other boy there is Phil Osborne? Yeah. Be quiet, you dope. Who are you? What Special do you want? Special agent of the FBI. What? Now, don't raise your voices. You're coming along with us. Come on. Yeah, but you don't now, understand. Now, no arguments. Come on, boys. And so, with the last beautiful glimpse of the sunset sinking into the bay, we say farewell to the beautiful island of Panaloa. <laughs> Bill Osborne and the two Sherman brothers were committed to reformatories until they are 21 years of age under the Federal Juvenile Delinquency Act. Lou Thomas and Charles Brown were sentenced to three and five years, respectively, for violating the National Stolen Property Act. And thus, three young boys were halted in their careers of crime by your FBI and given fresh chances to straighten out their lives and to become decent citizens. Every child deserves that chance. And the fact that there are as many juvenile delinquents as there are is not the fault of the children themselves, but of the adult population. When the parents of America face that fact honestly and try to do something about it, then and only then will the most important step have been taken. Law enforcement agencies like your FBI fight juvenile delinquency with every facility at their disposal but they cannot hope to win their fight without support. Support from you, the parents of America. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Fathers and mothers, the sure way to increase your child's chances of success in the future is to start an equitable education fund now. Remember, the average college graduate earns $72,000 more during his working years than the average American. So don't delay. Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case in the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a case that emphasizes the inherent viciousness of the professional criminal. Its subject, interstate theft. Its title, The Friendly Frame-Up. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The friendly frame-up on This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.